selamat pagi waktu Indonesia kawan-kawan semua uh, pada hari ini kita uh, prestis seri kami akan melakukan diskusi perdana kami ada saya Samuel uh, dan juga ada teman saya di sini Hai, silakan enggak <laughs> enggak <laughs> enggak ya enggak jadi uh, seperti biasa kami um, Kalau teman-teman tahu teolog awam, kami juga mengerjakan sama-sama sekarang ada presbiter yang fokus di filsafat agama. Ya, jadi kami akan mendiskusikan pada hari ini soal apa dan mengapa filsafat agama ya enggak? Yep, yep. Ya, jadi hari ini kami mengundang Joe Schmidt. Siapa Joe Schmidt ini? Joe Schmidt seorang filsuf ya. Dia dari Purdue University. And juga dia um, masih muda banget. Umurnya 21 tahun. Jadi uh, mungkin... Uh, apa ya bilangnya gimana ya ya cerdas mungkin ya enggak iya 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 saya dan Angga itu umurnya udah jauh di atas dia tapi ya gitulah kalau gua sam lu sih masih oke okay lah sam iya oke tanpa berlama-lama lagi mari kita undang Joe Smith di sini uh, teman-teman nanti kami akan menggunakan bahasa Inggris tapi as soon as possible kami akan taruh subtitle di bawah transkrip dalam bahasa Indonesia ya oke okay, so Yeah, without any further ado, uh, this is Joe here. Hi, Joe. Hey, how's it Hi, going? Joe. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Yeah, we're good here. How are you there? I'm doing well, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting that we have this time difference, but, you know, we made it work. So, yeah, we're here. We're having fun. Yeah, we're having fun. Thanks nice. to technology. Uh, so, yeah, thanks to technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 9, it's 9 p.m. there. And uh, where are you at, Joe? I am in Indiana, a state in the United States, so. Ah, yeah, Indiana. So it's ah. the eastern part, am I right? Yeah, it's ba- it's it's ah, at yeah. the westernmost part of eastern United States, basically. So I'm in the same time <laughs> as, like, New York and, like, Maine. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see. Ah, yeah. Oh, nice. So, yeah, we're philosophizing early in the morning, and Joe philosophizing late in the morning. So, <laughs> friends, I'm going to... Uh, introduce Joe first. So, uh, for those who don't know Joe, so Joe is a, uh, a philosopher. Uh, he finished his undergrad study in Purdue University, majoring in philosophy and minoring in microbiology. Am I right, Joe? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then, other than doing this scholarly work, uh, you could check out his papers there. I put some link there down in the descriptions. Uh, he already wrote a lot of papers in philosophy of religion. Other than that, he also doing a public work of philosophy with, you can check out his channel, um, Majesty of Reason. Right, Joe? Yes, absolutely. Okay, Um. so yeah, there, uh, here it is about Joe. You want to add something more, Joe, for our, for, for uh, maybe you want to add something more about yeah, yourself. So- Um, I guess I could just say, uh, well, firstly, thank you for having me on. I'm really excited for this. I've never done anything quite like this, so I'm, I'm really excited. Um, and yeah, like you said, I do both popular and scholarly work in philosophy. So it's interesting to kind of straggle the lines there between the, the scholarly side on the one hand and then the popular side on the other. So yeah, I've got, I publish papers and books and so on in peer reviewed journals. I also peer review other people's papers and so on. But uh, in addition to that, you know, I, I'm in this popular sphere, which is a different world. Um, so like YouTube and all that stuff. So, um, and I, I mainly on my channel, Majesty of Reason, I mainly have um, discussions between other philosophers and myself, as well as my own lecture style videos. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, we're really glad to have you here. It's so great to talk with. I know maybe you'll be a future big scholar in philosophy or religion, right? <laughs> Hopefully, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, fingers crossed. So um, maybe without any, uh, without any further ado, Joe, we're going to start our discussions for today. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. Um. So let's start with a warm up questions first. All right. So Joe. Um. You, uh, you're you're a philosopher. You're doing philosophy, so we always do these kind of things. When someone's came into uh, when when I met someone, uh, philosopher, I always ask them like, "What is philosophy for them?" And I also want to ask you, "What is philosophy for you, Joe?" And maybe after that, you may want to share how could you got into it, and also later, just like what doing what you're doing here, decided to do philosophy 
academically, professionally, like academic writing, etc. Yeah. So, Joe. Yeah. So, I guess with your first question there, like, what is philosophy? You know, we could kind of take that etymologically. So, philo Sophia, right? So, philo um, means love, and then Sophia means wisdom. You know, so you put them together, and you get love of wisdom. So that's kind of kind of cute, isn't it? But it doesn't really give us a full definition. So I guess as I see philosophy, it's really a field of study. And it's we could say it's something like the systematic and rigorous study of the fundamental nature of reality, the study of our epistemic access to that reality, right? So how we come to know things about reality as well as the study of the values that may or may not be instantiated in reality, like goodness, badness, rightness, wrongness, etc. And as well, how we should act within reality. So like, what is a right action? What is a good action? What should we do in certain situations? What's the moral thing to do? What's the correct moral theory? How do we decide what's right and wrong, etc. So it's really this hodgepodge almost of a bunch of different subfields and interesting questions pertaining to those various things that I just mentioned, like the fundamental nature of reality, that's going to be studied in metaphysics. So that's a that's an area of philosophy. And our epistemic access to reality, right, that's going to be studied in epistemology, the theory of knowledge. Similarly, the questions about value, about goodness, badness, and so on, that's going to be studied in what philosophers call axiology or value theory. And then finally, I mentioned ethics or the study of what we should do and what, what is the nature of right and wrong and so on. And then, of course, you have other major fields within philosophy like logic. So that's the study of valid inference, basically what follows from what. If you have a certain set of claims, can you derive from them another claim? Does that claim follow logically from the other claims? And then you also have philosophy of language. So it examines our usage of language, the various different pieces of language, and how our language connects up with reality. And so that's kind of what philosophy is. It's a field of study that studies all these various different things. And it asks questions about them, it probes them, and it has, a, it has lots of different methods also that it goes about studying these things. So it uses reasoning, of course, argumentation, logic, it uses critical thinking a lot. A lot of times we're comparing different theories, like different ethical theories or different theories about God, God's nature. Um, we are, we're also using intuitions a lot, so we come up with a certain scenario or a thought experiment and we test our intuitions about it. We also use math and scientific reasoning quite a lot. So philosophers, especially analytic philosophers, draw on the findings of math and science and so on, and they bring in formal methods to help them in their study and probing of philosophical questions. Philosophy also examines fundamental assumptions and presuppositions both of other disciplines and itself. So instead of taking for granted anything, really, philosophy questions everything. Uh, anything is up for grabs in philosophy. Nothing is really sacrosanct. Um, so yeah, philosophy asks bunches of questions about the foundations of things, like how do we even know that there's an external world? How do we even know that, um, really, how do we even know that anything exists? So it, it examines these fundamental assumptions and presuppositions of other fields, as well as the itself as a field. And so, yeah, these are lots of different tools that are used. But for me, right, I also like to add in, so you kind of ask what philosophy is like for me, I like to add in to this characterization of philosophy certain dispositional features of the person doing philosophy or the person engaging in philosophy. So these would be things like a love of truth, um, an insatiable curiosity, uh, open-mindedness, combined with a kind of skepticism, um, a willingness to question everything, intellectual perseverance, so persevering questions um, and, and teasing out the dialectic, teasing out arguments and objections and re rejoinders to those objections and further rejoinders and so on. So it's just, it's cultivating lots of these intellectual virtues like love of truth, curiosity, intellectual perseverance, intellectual humility, recognizing our limitations. Um, so I like to add those dispositional features to what philosophy is as well. Now you also asked, how did I myself get into philosophy? Well, Ever since I was younger, uh, I've basically always been debating things under the, you know, under the guise of philosophy. I just didn't really recognize it, right? So I would debate people when I was younger about um, abortion and about uh, evolution and really about anything that I was interested in. So I would always be debating people and constructing arguments and 
um, you know, testing other people's arguments and this sort of dialectic going back and forth in, you know, disagreeing parties. So ever since I can remember, really, I've been doing philosophy. I just didn't really know it at the time. And then I've also uh, been able to attend really good schools, especially Christian private schools, where I've taken theology classes basically every single day, right? And theology is quite similar to philosophy of religion, um, especially certain aspects of theology. So that is also getting me into the kind of philosophy of religion mindset. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into philosophy. And then how do I do it to, you know, the final aspect of your question, how do I, how did I decide to do philosophy professionally or in a kind of academic setting? Well, there are a lot of different factors. I mean, one of them is just passion, right? So I'm just really passionate about philosophy. And so naturally enough, you know, I kind of want to do something with my life that I'm passionate about. So, you know, I'll, I'm like, you know, why don't I just try to make a career out of this? Try to try to do something professionally, you know, academically. Uh, and publishing is basically the means by which you do that. Um, so, yeah, that's one reason. Another reason is um, like you can't just have the passion. You also have to try to develop the relevant skills. So I've also tried to cultivate the skills of being able to write and publish and so on. So passion plus skills sprinkle in there a little bit of luck, right? So um, I've come across people who have really helped me in my journey, who have given me feedback, people like Josh Rasmussen, who um, when I was younger, I used to email him back and forth and back and forth a lot about different philosophical questions. So combined with a little bit of luck about who I run into, um, combine that with a little bit of dedication, right? So I'm dedicated to the things. I, I mean, if I want to write a paper, I'm going to get it done. I'm going to submit it. I'm going to pursue it. So I'm, I'm very dedicated. And then finally, enjoyment, right? So that kind of ties back to the passion side but you know i just i enjoy academic philosophy in addition to just doing philosophy like we're doing like almost right here i also enjoy doing it academically it's much it's, it's very rigorous i can put my ideas down to paper um yeah I, I like all those aspects of it so yeah that's basically how i decided to do philosophy professionally and uh, i hope that i hope that answers your question yeah yeah thanks for the question so so interesting and so cool to hear to your stories uh, I'm, I'm very interested with, with uh, the fact that you went, uh, you went from, you came from, um, you have, uh, you had learned about theology before in Christian private school before going on, moving on to uh, philosophy. So I guess you have like some somewhat kind of Christian background. Well, mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really read your um, your works or anything. Like Sam introduces me to you. So this is the first time I, I I look a bit about what you what you do and apparently you have you you are working in mainly I don't know maybe maybe mainly or your interest is in philosophy of religion because of your upbringing right and yeah um yeah and, and if I'm mistaken um you you say that you're an agnostic I, I don't know maybe I don't know maybe uh, but again um because uh what you said just now about philosophy um. Uh, you know, like curiosity, um, seek questioning everything, um, trying to um, figure out everything. So do you think uh, it's just by uh, the nature of philosophers because you want to question, you want to find the truth, seekers of truth, right? Then the approach of theology that's normally kind of more, you know, like normative is not suitable and by nature you'll be more kind of agnostic. Is that what you're going trying to say? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, yeah, it's like why philosophy over theology, for instance. That's a good question. Um, I mean, one reason, yeah, is because I kind of have that more dispositional. I have dispositions toward questioning things, and you know, theology oftentimes takes a lot of basic assumptions for granted, and then goes on to kind of develop theories about it. So, in analytic theology, for instance, you might take for granted God's existence, and you might take for granted. Um, some form of, you know, the Bible, roughly speaking, what it says is true. And then you might try to develop theories on the basis of that. that that's a common thing that you do in, in theology. Whereas for philosophers of religion, they're going to say, well, hold on a second. Should we assume that God exists? You know, should we, should we assume these sorts of things? And so philosophers are really getting to the foundations of basically any other discipline, including itself. And for me, I'm, I'm interested in getting to the foundations of things. Um, I really like getting to those, those, yeah, the deepest questions of the most fundamental presuppositions. Um, it's like, hey, you're assuming that. Is that true? Can we assume that? And so on. So it, it's just very interesting. And that's that's really one reason I was more gravitated towards philosophy than theology. But yet, yet another reason, as you point out, is, um, yeah, the agnosticism. Um, 
I, to do theology, I think I'd probably have to share those underlying core commitments, um, which I don't. So yeah, that, that's one. That's one reason. That's another reason. So yeah, good question. Well, thank you so much, Joe. It's really yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So yeah, uh, maybe I could say that when you're going into philosophy, there is the way out, right? The uh, the way you you go into philosophy, you will questions everything, and you can't stop the questions everything, right? So yeah, that's what I I guess that's also what we experience when we start doing philosophy. Thank you, Joe, for your answers. Um, maybe I'm going to continue for the next one, Joe. So yeah, we have we heard from you. What is philosophy, right? So now let's get into a more specific way. Philosophy of religion. So what is it? Uh, can you elaborate a bit, Joe? Yeah, and I mean, just before I elaborate on that, I mean, I guess I should mention that um, one, I basically do research in three main areas in philosophy. One of them is philosophy of religion, but two others are metaphysics more generally and also philosophy, excuse me, philosophy of time. So, you know, questions like what is the nature of time? What is the nature of persistence? Why do things persist? And so on. So philosophy of, philosophy of religion isn't my only area, but it's, it's one of my central areas. But now getting to your question, I just wanted to clarify that for the audience in case anyone was interested. So uh, going to your question, what is philosophy of religion? Well, we've already, so, so we know the philosophy aspect of that because we covered that. But what is philosophy of religion, right? So it's basically, as, as I understand it, or at least as I see it, it's a kind of philosophical study of religion and things pertaining to religion, such as God's existence, God's nature, God's relation to the world, the afterlife, uh, comparative religion, you know, comparing the different claims of religions and, you know, seeing the relative merits and plausibilities of, of them. Um, I think I already said the afterlife, whether belief in God can be rational, um, what we should do in light of religious disagreement across different traditions. Uh, and so on. So you're basically taking a lot of these questions that arise in the context of religion, and you're applying the philosophical methods and tools and so on to them. So yeah, it's basically a philosophical study of, of religion and things pertaining to religion. And I, I mentioned a, a, a number of those. Now, that kind of raises the question, what is religion? And that's immensely difficult to define. <laughs> so I don't really have a definition to hand of that. Um, it is very difficult to define. I mean, there are certain characteristic features that I can point to. So typically religions involve something of ultimate concern. So that might be a God, but it also might be something like a karmic cycle. It might be something like the Tao or, you know, something, something that's like perhaps an ultimate reality or something that um, we should orient our lives around something of ultimate concern. So that's, that's pretty characteristic of religions. Um, something else that's characteristic of religions is our dedication to um, that, that ultimate concern, uh, you know, usually there are certain prescriptions or normative guidelines about how we should act in relation to that ultimate or ultimates, right? It could be a collection. It also typically involves um, social aspects like um, rituals in a social setting and uh, belief systems and uh, lots of other things. So, you know, there are certain characteristics that you can point to that are at least very, very, very common uh, across the range of religions. So while I don't have a definition of religion, um, <laughs> that, that kind of gives a, it gives a glimpse into what it is. So yeah, that, that's, um, that's philosophy of religion. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, so like, because one of your, your area is philosophy of religion, to your knowledge, uh, what are the current issues that philosophers of religious philosophy have recently, like, discussed the popular ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> I guess I'll give, um, I guess I'll give a range of questions sort of that um, philosophers of religion tackle. And then after that, I'll, I'll like, highlight some hot topics that are, that are kind of recent. Um, so what are, what are some questions that a, a philosopher of religion might ask or might investigate? Well, you know, of course, one of the major ones is, does God exist? Uh, another one is, like, what are the arguments for and against God's existence? Like, how plausible are they? Um, does evil, for instance, count against God's existence? Does the existence of the universe count in favor of God's existence? And so on. You can also ask, what is the nature of ultimate reality? Um, if it's divine, what is the nature of that divine thing? If it's not divine, what is the nature of that non-divine thing? 
Uh, you could also ask, is anything worthy of worship? Could anything be worthy of worship? You could also ask, um, you know, if God exists, again, what would he be like? Would it be timeless or would it be temporal? Would he be simple or would he be complex? Would he be immutable or would he be mutable? Uh, would he have comprehensive foreknowledge of the future, including our free our free actions and free choices in the future? Or would he not have comprehensive foreknowledge of the future? Um, furthermore, can belief in God be rational? And under what conditions is it rational? How should we deal with religious disagreement? You know, there are lots of pretty smart agnostics, lots of pretty smart atheists, lots of pretty smart Christians, lots of pretty smart Muslims, and so on. Yikes, how should we, how should anyone really navigate this kind of uh, reasonable disagreement among people? Um, yeah, how, how can we, how can we claim, how can we have knowledge claims in these sorts of domains if there are really smart people who disagree with us? Um, what, what is religious experience, right? And what is its evidential significance, right? Lots of people seem to experience God in their lives or seem to maybe even experience the absence of God in their lives. What should we make of that? Um, is there an afterlife? And if so, what is it, what would it be like? Uh, and there are many more besides. So like, there's a huge list of really interesting questions that philosophers of religion investigate. And I, some hot topics, at least that I'm interested in and that you, know, you see being published on nowadays, I mean, it, certainly arguments for and against God's existence. So, you know, there's a lot of talk on the problem of evil, of course, and new versions of the problem of evil, new objections to it, and so on. Um, there is a lot of talk about different arguments for God's existence that's really kind of burgeoning and, and, and um, flowering as of late. So, you know, fine-tuning and teleological arguments, um, cosmological arguments, like the Kalam cosmological argument. These are generating a lot of literature both for and against. So these are some hot topics. I guess in my own sort of research, I'm interested in a, a recent topic called causal finitism, which is the view that there cannot be infinite causal chains of dependence. So basically there can't be infinite causal regresses where A is caused by B, which is caused by C, which is caused by D and so on ad infinitum. That's the thesis of causal finitism. And there's been a lot of really interesting stuff both for and against it in the literature as of late. And I've, I'm doing some publishing on that right now, even I'm, I'm writing on it. Also, um, you know, stuff that's really interesting in uh, Earth, a hot, another hot topic is uh, divine simplicity. So whether everything in God is identical to God. So like, is God identical to his omniscience? Is God identical to his omnipotence? And so on. Um, and then finally, another really hot topic is um, the relationship between free will and divine foreknowledge. Uh, it's like, whoa, like if God knew a billion years ago what I would do tomorrow, it's how, how could I be free, you might ask, to do otherwise than I will in fact do tomorrow, right? Because, you know, it seems as though the past is fixed. I can't really change the past. And so if I could do otherwise than I'm going to do tomorrow, it would seem as though I'd have to be able to bring it about a billion years ago that God believed something different than he believed a billion years ago. And it just doesn't seem like I have that power, right? The past is fixed. And so then it would seem as though I can't do otherwise tomorrow. And so then do we get a kind of fatalism? No one can do otherwise than they in fact do. We're all kind of just determined to do what we do. So interesting questions. And um, yeah, these are all kind of at the forefront. These are some of the, the hot topics that um, philosophers of religion are discussing. Nice, really interesting. Um, so yeah, yeah, philosopher of religion discuss those kind of things. What I want, what we want to know, Joe, uh, as far as we know, right, you can correct it, but, but probably it is true that you're an, an, an you're an, an agnostic, right? You're an agnostic. So I wonder, as an agnostic, uh, shouldn't be the, you care less about issues on divinity or philosophy of religion, right? A lot of people say that agnostic, agnostic feel that it's it's pointless, it's useless, right? So you're a philosopher of real, uh, philosophy of religion. You're an agnostic. How do you approach philosophy of religion as an agnostic? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, I mean, for the audience, here's what I mean when I say that I'm an agnostic um, or when I call myself an agnostic. What I mean is just that by my lights, uh, the evidence and reasons for and against God's existence roughly counterbalance one another. So that, that is what I mean by my lights, the, the reasons and evidence that I've looked into and investigated. There are different kinds of agnostics, right? So there's a different kind of agnostic from the one that I just described. This other kind of agnostic could say, let's say for instance, they could say that 
no one could know in principle whether or not God exists. Or maybe they could say there's no evidence whatsoever on either side. Notice that I didn't say either of those things, right? I don't say it's impossible to know or have justified belief on either side. I also didn't say, you know, so I'm not saying that this is like a question that's cognitively beyond our grasp. It's like too hard for us or whatever, you know, our puny monkey brains or whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't say that it is um, beyond us. I don't think that uh, you can't have justified beliefs on these matters. And I also don't say that there's no evidence on either side. I actually think there's a lot of evidence on both sides. And that's one of the reasons why I'm agnostic. There, I, I see by my lights good reasons on each side that, that pull me roughly equally to either side. So that's that's what I mean when I say I'm agnostic. Now, you, you ask a good question. Should I be less concerned about philosophy of religion given that I'm an agnostic? Well, I would say given the kind of agnostic that I am, that I just clarified, right? I would say no, right? Because I'm not saying that you can't have justified beliefs on the matter or that you can't know one way or another or that it's beyond our grasp or that um, there's no evidence either way, so it's pointless. No, I actually think that there are significant considerations on both sides. And what that means is that, you know, I'm in a position to really start like weighing these up and like, I can look at the arguments, I can, you know, evaluate the plausibility of them. And um, it's not as though I'm close foreclosing the possibility of this kind of inquiry. No, I, I do think that this is a question that we can really get a hold on and that we can investigate with the tools of reason and experience and um, science and so on. So um, I, I, I don't think I should be less concerned. I mean, uh, that, that's one thing that I, I would say. Uh, and I mean, moreover, like, why am I concerned, you might ask? Well, these questions are just so monumentally significant, right? Go back to the questions that I was just pointing to. They're so significant, at least by my lights. Like, whether God exists, what's the nature of ultimate reality? I mean, <laughs> whether we can have a relationship with God if God exists, you know, like, that would be one of the most significant things that there is in human life, right? These pertain, these questions pertain to human flourishing, right? So, by my lights, there, there's a lot on the line here. It's very important. It's very significant, <laughs> as evinced by those questions that I was raising. And, you know, um, there's the potential for uh, in inheriting eternal life. And, you know, like, these are hugely important questions. And so um, I think there's no reason for me not to be concerned about them. So there's every reason to be concerned. So then you do ask, uh, how do I approach philosophy of religion then as an agnostic? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I actually don't think that it affects my approach much as opposed to others. You know, I can still assess arguments for and against God's existence on their own merits, right? I can just look at an argument and just see, hey, um, what reasons do we have to accept this premise? Let's look at those reasons. Do those reasons hold up? Uh, what are some of the underlying assumptions here? You know, like I can tease those out without regard to my prior commitments. So, and that's one of the main things that I do in, in my work. I look at these certain arguments and I see if they work. So it really doesn't affect me all that much. Um, I mean, some ways that it does affect me is, uh, you know, when it comes to questions about the nature of God. So I'm interested in debates about what God would be like if he exists. So that's called debates about models of God, you know, like, how do we model God? How do we conceive of him or understand of him and his nature and his relation to the world? It does kind of affect me there, right? Because you might ask, well, hold on a second. If you're agnostic, then you don't strictly speaking affirm that God exists. So then like, what are you investigating? Well, what I'm investigating is a conditional, right? A conditional, if, right? If God exists, then what would he be like, right? If God exists, what would he be like? So agnostics can, can perfectly well investigate that question and, and take views on that and take stances on that, right? Because that's not committing you to God's existence. It's just saying, if God exists, what would he be like, right? What would his nature be like? And so, um, you know, like, would he be timeless? Would he be temporal? Would he be simple? Would he be complex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, firstly, I don't think it affects me all that much. But secondly, in the, in the places that it does, um, you can just uh, construe the investigations as conditional. You can just say, if God exists, what would follow? Um, so, yeah. Well, nice, Joe. Um, yeah, I think it's fit in with your definitions when you say that open-mindedness is one of the things that you know philosophers should have, or maybe yeah, the the thing that we philosophers usually had, right? So you know, to be an agnostic and to be a philosopher in who um, who doing philosophy of religion, yeah, you, you need to be someone who's one-minded, right? Uh, check out all the arguments, uh, you know, and treat each arguments. In its own merits, you know those kind of things, right? So yeah, it's really fit in with your definitions back then about about philosophy, I think. So yeah, you're just letting the evidence leads you 
I guess that's yeah, as best as I can, it. you know. Unfortunately, we all suffer yeah, from different true. biases, um, but you know, we yeah. can at least we can at least try. We can give it a shot to mitigate biases. So, um, to the extent that I can, <laughs> I try. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joel, I wonder, and, and, do, you, do you ever uh, like change your mind in some issues? Like, no, yeah, yeah. an example. I, I back then I was really into uh, planting a philosophy, right? Back then, but uh, you know. Uh, people change, and I'm starting to be skeptical towards its project in philosophy of religion. You ever have those kind of things like you change your mind about some issues in philosophy? Yeah, yeah, I definitely do. And even in philosophy of religion, you know, like I'll, um, I'll be like, I used to think that this objection to this argument works, but I'm like, nah, no, it doesn't work anymore because I, you know, I come across another consideration, or uh, you know, certain evidential chips are added to my scale. You know, like uh, there's a recent argument for God's existence that I found really interesting and you know, somewhat plausible. It's um, by philosophers Dustin Crummett and um, boy, oh boy, I'm forgetting his name. I think it's Brian Cutter. Yeah, um, it's called the argument from psychophysical harmony. Uh, so it, it's it's one of these non-traditional arguments that people haven't really developed in the history of philosophy. So it's one of the newer, newerish ones. And it's really interesting, right? So that's like something that I'm weighing on my scales and that, you know, so long story short, yes, I am continually updating and changing based on um, based on what I come across and what I think about and how I reevaluate things. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. I really like uh, to, to, to hear that from you because I guess... Because personally, for me, I think uh, if a philosopher is keep on like, like questioning and keeps on learning, uh, I would feel like definitely you should actually change your mind eventually. You know, little by little, but up to a point. Yeah, it would anyway, be. I just want to say uh, it would be surprising if at the very outset of your inquiry, let's say decades ago or years ago, you happened to hit on absolutely all of the truths concerning philosophy. So it'd be very surprising if someone who is really, you know, attentive to the evidence and so on doesn't change their mind at some points and some things. Um, surely at the beginning, you didn't hit absolutely every single one of these highly controversial questions. The perfect, the perfectly true, you know, so that's just very important and probable. Yeah, yeah. And then I think related to that, you, you, you talk about your biases and our biases. Um, and from this conversation, I think I agree with this question, how the philosophy of religion is, I would say, kind of monolithic to Christian, at least monotheistic apologetics, and even white centered. Well, if we refer to Harris. So um, I'd like to hear your opinion uh, on such criticism. Yeah, so I uh, I actually think that that's that's a, a totally fair criticism and it's totally true. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely true that um, at least a lot of philosophy of religion, arguably most, is indeed uh, we could say Eurocentric ish, um, uh, quite white centric ish. I mean, it's dominated by white males in the field, right? I mean, part of that might be part of it. Part of it might be um, uh, you know males being more interested in debating and so on from the get-go and then so like you know it's like given certain male interests they're more likely to go in but like that surely cannot explain why it's like 99 like 99 percent. it's like there's definitely um there's definitely certain biases and prejudices that shape who gets to you know get academic positions who gets tenure uh who uh, gets to publish certain things and so on and it's unfortunate right because it has been favoring in general uh, you know like these kind of white male stereotypes or whatever. So yes, um, that, that's definitely uh, present. Um, and, I mean, lots of people, right? This is, this is a, a you, you gave a reference to Harris, but you know, this has been um, recognized by lots of like prominent philosophers of religion, especially with respect to like the, the Christian centric and apologetic overtones of it, right? <laughs> so like uh, Graham Oppie has mentioned this and lamented it and criticized it. Paul Draper has mentioned this and criticized it. Um, uh, Paul Draper is a big critic of it. Um, Helen de Cruz and, and and still others, uh, they they've pointed to this disproportionate bias towards Christianity in uh, you know contemporary Anglophone analytic philosophy of religion. So, yes, I mean you I mean you could just see that. I mean you open up the the main uh, journals for philosophy of religion, and yeah, I mean the questions that are being asked and being published on are like. 95% are just like Christian things. So yes. Um, and I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it does indeed have like apologetic overtones. It's like a lot of people are getting into 
philosophy of religion almost to weaponize it so that they can defend their pre-existent tribe and that they can use these arguments and build up a shield and you know show that others are irrational and so on um so yeah i mean that is unfortunate and that is uh you definitely see that um i mean there are some positives there are some positives especially as of late right so um you know there are people working to change this so um yuji nagasawa for instance uh he's received a massive templeton uh, grant I think it's, I, I forget how many, how much money, but it might've been like $3 million. I forget exactly how, but it was a lot of money. It was one of these Templeton grants and it's a grant to globalize philosophy of religion. Um, and basically to help bring in Eastern perspectives and indigenous perspectives and African perspectives and uh, female perspectives and so on. Um, in fact, they just had a conference where, you know, they were bringing in like, um, there was this, um, female monk that they brought in, for instance, and it was one of these Eastern religions. I, I didn't look at the details, right? So I, I don't know which particular and what the person's name was. Um, so they, they, even, they just had like a conference. So anyway, my point is that um, there are people working to redress this, to correct it, and to bring in these neglected perspectives, these perspectives that have been unfairly shut out and haven't been given the light of day. So yeah, I mean, I just want to say that, I, yeah, for the most part, I, I agree with that, but that there are positive signs that people are are recognizing this <laughs> yeah oh thank you joe yeah yeah um for your information i also got the grant uh for translating opie's work into indonesian so yeah yeah i'm oh, I'm, nice. I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh on my way and it's going to be finished in two months hopefully nice <laughs> nice yeah that's awesome. so yeah that's what happened also in indonesia joe most of the philosophers here are christians and specifically catholics uh, and even there are a what is it uh uh they, they're the those who have some positions in the church you know so yeah, oh, yeah most of the philosophers of philosophy of religion here are mostly them and so that's what i'm trying to do you know we should listen from the atheists such as Opie, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, he's arguing about uh, arguing about God's, uh, yeah. yeah. And it's really important for the taste Christian philosopher to listen from him. So yeah, yeah. Um, Joe, um, about books now, I want to hear your, uh, can you hear my sound clearly? Yep. It's a bit cracking out there. But we can hear you fine. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah okay about books joe um thank you for those yeah uh, for for the for the time uh I want... do you have any recommended resources books youtube channel websites or articles for those who want to start their philosophy of religion adventure joe can, can you give yeah. any any things Yes, it is most definitely an adventure, uh, and the adventure never seems to end. <laughs> so, um, you know, just because there's so many different interesting questions and avenues. So, yeah, so in terms of getting into philosophy of religion, um, there are five books that I, I recommend people check out, and they're all introductory level books. Some of them are more a little bit more complicated than the others. I'll say which one is my favorite, um, but yeah, there are five of them. I'll start with my favorite. Um, it is William Rowe. He has an introduction to philosophy of religion. Um, I really like it. It's very clear. It's accessible and it's, it's, it doesn't get rid. It doesn't, it doesn't jettison the, the rigor that should be characteristic of, of philosophy, but it's also accessible. So that, that's probably my favorite. And, you know, of course, William Rowe, he went to, uh, didn't went, to, he was a professor at Purdue university. So, um, Paul Draper was actually his, um, replacement once, um, uh, yeah, once William Rowe was gone. So yeah, that's my favorite, um, his intro to philosophy of religion. Uh, the next one, which is very, very good, uh, it's slightly technical, but um, yeah, it's by Keith Yandel. Uh, I think I pronounced that right. And it's called Philosophy of Religion, A Contemporary Introduction. That is published by Rutledge. Uh, they have these series called um, Rutledge Contemporary Introductions to Philosophy. Sorry, I've got one on free will right next to me. They're, they're so good. So yeah, he's got one on um, philosophy of religion that I highly recommend people check out. And then three more that are introductions to philosophy of religion that I recommend people check out. One of them is by Michael Murray and Michael Ray, and it's called An Introduction to Philosophy of Religion. And then um, Brian Davis. It, it's pronounced Davis, but it's spelled Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S. Um, he also has an introduction to philosophy of religion that I recommend. 
And then finally, the final introduction to uh, philosophy of religion that I recommend is by Chad Meister. It is called Introducing Philosophy of Religion. So those are five that I recommend. Now, it's somewhat difficult to get into philosophy of religion if you don't know the basics of philosophy to begin with, right? So, I mean, I would recommend at least, you know, studying general philosophy more generally, especially because philosophy of religion intersects all these other different fields. Like you're going to have to be getting into philosophy of mind, like the nature of consciousness and so on, because there are different arguments from consciousness. You're going to have to be looking, I mean, certain arguments for God's existence presuppose certain theories of time as opposed to others. So you need to know about metaphysics and philosophy of time. It's a very integrated field. So, you know, knowing about general philosophy is going to be good. Uh, so what do I recommend with that? Well, one thing that people could do is check out my video what is philosophy? That is what I, that's the title of the video. And I go through a bunch of different recommendations for basically introducing one, oneself to philosophy and certain foundational texts that can really help get one up to speed in, in the basics of the discipline. Um, I do have a couple right next to me. So one of them, this was really recent. It is by Michael Humer. It is called Knowledge, Reality, and Value. This is a beautiful book. It is wonderfully written. It is super duper accessible. And it's by one of the best philosophers alive, Michael Humer. And so, yeah, I highly recommend checking that out. The next one is one of my favorites, The Philosopher's Toolkit, a Compendium of Philosophical Concepts and Methods by Bajini and Fosel. Very good as well. A Shameless Self-Plug, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. So I myself wrote uh, basically an intro to philosophy. It's more so for intermediates. So that's, that's, I would recommend checking out the other ones first, but this, I mean, it'll give you tools to think critically in the context of philosophy. And I also don't overlook the dispositional side of things. So I talk about how you can have productive conversations, how you can cultivate these sorts, sorts of virtues that I was mentioning at the beginning of our conversation um, and so on. And, you know, I also talk about how do you evaluate an argument? How do you unpack assumptions? How do you, et cetera. So that's another one that I would recommend. And finally, this one's another kind of intermediate. It is by David Papineau. It's called Philosophical Devices, Proofs, Probabilities, and Sets. Uh, proofs, Probabilities, Possibilities, and Sets. So that's this is very good. This will get you up to date on, because lots of philosophy uses things like set theory and probability. So this will give you the basics of that. Okay. So that's general philosophy and philosophy of religion. Those are my recommendations. What about YouTube? Well, there is a panoply of lectures and information on YouTube. General philosophy, you know, you, I mean, there are so many different channels. There's like philosophy overdose. There's, um, there's just so much. I mean, you, you can, people can find general philosophy channels um, on their own. Uh, uh, wireless philosophy, that's another good one, um, and others. Specifically with respect to philosophy of religion, though, I just collected together, so there are more that I'm neglecting because it would get unwieldy if I were to put all of them down. So I just took three atheist channels and three theist channels and then my own right so i'd recommend people check out the majesty of reason of course right my own channel <laughs> i highly recommend that i mean i do assume in a lot of my videos that you'd have the relevant background um so that's a caveat so a lot of my videos are kind of technical but you know you gotta gotta get into it somehow uh but anyway the three channels the three non-theist or atheist channels that i'm going to mention are um in no particular order number one is real atheology Number two is Emerson Green. He has a nice channel. Um, yeah, it's just called Emerson Green. Uh, and then finally is Non Alchemist. Non Alchemist. Uh, his name is Dustin. He, he also runs a kind of philosophy slash counter apologetics style channel. Um, so, yeah, that's the non theist side. And then on the theist side, I also picked three. So, number one is Capturing Christianity uh, by Cameron Bertuzzi. Number two is The Analytic Christian by Jordan Hampton. And then number three is Apologetics Squared. Uh, it's a nice little channel that um, goes through interesting arguments. Now, um, you know, a lot of these, you know, all of these are put by put together by white English males or white American males. So it's like, you know, it's a bit unfortunate, but um, those are the ones that came to mind readily and the ones that I think would be good for people to get into these sorts of things. But, you know, also check out the work of uh, females in the field, like Liz Jackson, for instance, right? She has been on Capturing Christianity. She's been on The Analytic Christian. She has her own channel, which is really good. I think it's called Philosophy or something. Or you could just search Liz Jackson Philosophy. It'll come up. Um, 
so yeah, and I mean, I'm sure you can also find nice channels on Judaism, Islam, etc. So anyway, those are the ones that came to mind for YouTube. What about websites? Well, I really only picked two here. Um, and the two are just uh, the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. These are both excellent resources. They are totally free and they have entries, uh, you know, like basically academic articles on almost anything you want to look at in philosophy. So they have lots of things on philosophy of religion, arguments for God's existence, etc. Now, they do get a little bit technical, especially the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy is meant to be a little bit more uh, intermediate slash beginner friendly. But still, check those out. They are very, very good um, for websites. So yeah, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And then uh, instead of papers, I'm just going to put some journals on your audience's radar that publish in philosophy of religion because that's where you're going to find all the papers. So you could basically just go to these journals and then search up a topic like divine foreknowledge or something. And then, you know, they would pop up. So um, I put down five. These are kind of like major philosophy of religion uh, journals. So one of them is called Religious Studies. Yuji Nagasawa is actually the uh, senior editor of that. Um, number two is Faith and Philosophy. That's put together by the Society of Christian Philosophers. All their uh, papers are open access, so they're all free. Uh, number three is the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Number four is the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion. And number five is Sophia. Okay, so those are five journals in philosophy of religion specifically that specialize in that. And then finally is uh, there's, I guess for general philosophy, there's this journal called Philosophy Compass, and they publish, I mean, it's similar to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, but they basically publish papers that are meant to be accessible to like an undergraduate in philosophy. And they basically lay out an issue or lay out a debate or lay out an argument and summarize the debate and summarize certain recent moves. It, they're really good. So I recommend that. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I really recommend uh, with respect to this question. Okay, nice. Thank you so much for those recommendations. And friends, I'm going to put all the link there, uh, the, 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 the link for the books, maybe on Amazon or the, the journal. So you can check it out there in the descriptions. Yeah. So yeah. Joe, I think it's 47 minutes already. I, 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 we don't have any more questions, but there is one question from our friends there, uh, YouTube. It's from uh, Ludi. So, hi, Joe. Thanks for the great talk. If you don't mind me asking, what is or are the reason that you finally decided to become an agnostic? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, why are you an agnostic? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there it's are a lot. It's not too personal. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's good. There are lots of different reasons. Um, I mean, there are tons, it, you know, just these huge concoction of factors. Um, one thing that this person can do if they're interested or what the audience can do if they're interested, I actually made a video. It's one of my earliest videos, so they're probably gonna have to scroll a little bit. If they go to my channel, Majesty of Reason, they're gonna have to probably scroll a little bit, but they'll find it. It is called why am I agnostic? So it answers this question. And it's, uh, it's like an hour 44 minutes, uh, but it's, you'll be rewarded if you watch it. Um, I put in a lot of effort into that video. So, so yeah, that's one thing that I would recommend checking out. Now, I guess, I guess I could just say one of the major things was a version of the argument from evil. That was one of the major things that really started pushing me away from uh, the beliefs that I grew up with. So... This version of the problem of evil focuses in particular on the evolutionary process and how for hundreds of millions of years, animals have just been ripping each other to shreds and animals have been suffering and preying upon each other and um, being parasites. And, you know, animals have just been languishing and suffering for hundreds of millions of years. And so it's, there's just this profound protracted process of suffering that... Um, was the very means and the mechanism, if God exists, is the very means and mechanism by which God brought about biological diversity and humans. It's like the engine of creation was death and suffering and, and nature red in tooth and claw and parasitism and languishing. And I just found that to be extremely surprising if um, there's this um, all-powerful 
omnipotent, providentially governing, perfectly good creator. It just seemed very surprising by my lights that this gruesome process would be the very engine of creation. By contrast, it's nowhere near as surprising by my lights um, if the foundation of reality is just indifferent to the flourishing and languishing of creatures. It doesn't, it doesn't really care. It's not like this perfectly good God that cares about um, the flourishing and languishing of sentient creatures, of conscious creatures capable of suffering. So that's one of the reasons that really pushed me towards, um, pushed me towards agnosticism, or we should say perhaps away from the beliefs that I grew up with. So that's one reason there are lots of others. And, you know, there are lots of other arguments for God's existence that uh, I think have some merit. Uh, but, but yeah, um, I hope that can uh, at least pique their interest. Okay, thank you, Joe. So, Dudi, you may want to check out the comments there. Eh, sorry, the, uh, the, the videos that um, Joe already made in his channel. Anga, you want to add something? Yeah, can I, can I comment on something? I mean, like, it just interests me the way you put it out. So, um, throughout the conversation, I would, can I, can I kind of, con not conclude, but take a, like, I, I was a conclusion uh, from what you told us that in regards to philosophy of religion for you, Joe, personally, your interest grows up because um, of your personal, I wouldn't, maybe it's personal searching for truth. And in such a way that you come from a background and tradition that uh, present this model, particular model of God and when faced with, I don't know, maybe from your um, explanation just now, kind of scientific, recent, newer scientific findings turns out for you to be no longer compelling. And it, so, and it drives you to be an agnostic, but in, as you explained before, your when you say agnostic, agnostic does not always have to be someone who is apathetic towards the truth and, and God talk. And maybe be, even becoming an atheist is not always equal to anti-God, but simply mm -hmm. uh, you are not convinced with the argument that God exists, or you can you can no longer believe to these particular models of God. But by doing work in the philosophy of religion uh, research field, maybe I don't know. Maybe you are actually um, looking and learning about other models of God that. I don't know, maybe the, eventually the, the, the end of things is that you want to make sense of the world. Is that how would you put it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the major things. I mean, one of the definitions of philosophy by one uh, prominent philosopher is philosophy is basically um, the study of how things in the most broadest sense of the term hang together in the most broadest sense of the term or whatever. <laughs> so it's just how things hang together. How do we make sense of things? We find ourselves in this reality. How do we make sense of it? How do we make sense of how we got here? How do we make sense of how anything exists? How do we make sense of how we come to know things? How do we make sense of how we should live in reality? It's like how things hang together in the broadest sense of the term. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the fundamental animating spirit. Uh, I, I want to see how things hang together. Um, I really want to form this picture of reality that hopefully, um, helps me get into touch with reality better. It helps me have more true beliefs and fewer false beliefs. Um, and that also helps me flourish as, as a human being. So, yeah. Uh, uh, apparently uh, we have several more questions, Joe. Is it okay if we uh, that's pull fine. it up and... Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, I've heard that there are over 150 plus arguments about God's existence, but, but is it really that many? How many arguments about God's existence we could count? Also, how do we know that these argument is really an argument? And are there limits of these arguments? Thanks. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so uh, recently uh, on the channel Capturing Christianity, well, really, it wasn't that recent. Okay, it kind of was. It was like a year and a half ago or something. Um, something like that. Um, uh, a philosopher, Dr. Chad McIntosh, put together a, a really nice... Um, presentation where he wasn't really defending the arguments, but he was just laying them out and putting them on people's radars, essentially. He's just alerting people to their existence. Um, and so, yeah, he formalized these arguments. Uh, it was around 150 of them. Some of them were for the conclusion that God exists. Some of them were for the conclusion that there's an, like an uncaused cause. Some of them was for the conclusion that we should commit to God's existence. You know, like, so are there 150? Well, 
not really and like these aren't really independent of one another right so one of them will be like a minor variation of the other so one of them might be like every contingent thing has a cause and this is then you conclude to like a necessary being but another one might be like well every contingent thing has an explanation and you know it's like it's not really that different um so like a lot of these aren't independent arguments from one another um so they they rest on a lot of the same assumptions they rest on a lot of the same premises even though they might slightly differ so are there 150 not really uh i mean in short not really but there are a lot um on both sides actually um so felipe leon he has a blog called ex apologist and he put together right now the the number is at like 125 or something um but he has put together a similar list of and again these are like scholarly articles that are published publishing these arguments uh, he put together a list of atheistic arguments so you know the 150 is arguments for god um these 125 or whatever is arguments against god so i mean listen we can argument count and argument count but really what matters is um what matters is the plausibility of the arguments and whether or not they're independent from one another so you really just have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis right um i don't think the number of plausible arguments for god's existence is anywhere near 150. um but I mean, it's definitely, uh, I mean, you could definitely at least count it on maybe a hand or something, you know? Um, so there are really interesting arguments out there. And so, yeah, I mean, they are worth contending with and they're not to be dismissed on both sides. Um, so I would, I mean, yeah, if people are interested, I would highly recommend checking out. Um, anyway, just, just pursuing these arguments further on both sides. And, um, and yeah, I, I also made a, a 12 hour long video uh, going through the 150 arguments. So yes, it was 12 hours long and, um, uh, and yeah, I basically, I wanted to put, put on people's radars certain scholarly criticisms of the arguments that, that um, certain non-theistic scholars have put together. Um, so yeah, I would just say uh, a lot of these aren't dependent, but you really have to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, I would say in principle, you know, some of them could succeed in principle. There's nothing in principle stopping some, one of these arguments being a successful argument. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. I think that's it i think there's no more questions so we have 57 minutes almost an hour thank you for taking such a long time to talk about philosophy of religions light in the night so yeah joe i'm i'm, I'm, I'm we, we really appreciate what you're doing and also what you you're doing here right now so yeah thank you so much joe yeah thank you for having me and yeah i mean i love having these sorts of conversations and i hope that the recommendations and the various uh, points that I made could uh, help your audience and really, yeah, help people explore these matters further. Yeah, um, we're really hoping that it's not the first time. Yeah, if you have if you have another time, we're really glad to have you around here again. Awesome. Yeah. So, friends, uh, jadi, uh, I'm gonna speak in Indonesia. Jadi, teman-teman, uh, saya pikir saya uh, aku uh, akan mengakhiri sesi malam hari ini. Eh, kok malam sih? Uh, pagi hari ini kita akan ketemu lagi di di waktu-waktu lainnya dengan isu yang sama juga dengan membahas soal filsafat agama. So again, thank you Joe, thank you everyone. I'm gonna end our broadcast here today. See you in another time.